Okay, so uh, welcome again, everyone, to this uh, special uh, Laudato Si week webinar. Uh, Whose Earth Is It? Decolonizing Ecotheology with Dr. Juwanza Eric Clark. Uh, this evening's presentation, as you know, uh, many of you have been on our Zooms before, uh, is co-sponsored by four wonderful organizations. Uh, the Office of Peace, Justice, and Ecological uh, Integrity of Creation of the Sisters of Charity of New York. And we have Sister Carol D'Angelo, the director of that office with us. Uh, my office, the Office of Peace, Justice, and Ecological Integrity of the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth in New Jersey, across the river from Carol. Uh, ROAR, religious organizations along the river, in this case, uh, the Hudson River. And we have uh, several members of ROAR on, including Doretta Cornell, who is our fearless convener. Uh, and then also a new co-sponsor is Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement. So thanks to everyone for their contribution for putting this evening together. Uh, this is, is, as you probably know, a follow-up to the very successful uh, Zoom series we had last year on the seven goals of the Laudato Si Action Platform, which many of you attended. And the recordings have been viewed by thousands of people literally. So it's it was a great success. When I send around the link for tonight's recording, I'll also include uh, the link on how to access the previous ones. We're also planning another uh, follow-up one, a follow-up Zoom on environmental advocacy. So stay, uh, stay tuned for news about that. Um, we'll begin in a moment with uh, the prayer led by Sister Carol D'Angelo. Uh, then I'll introduce uh, Dr. Clark, who will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up for comments and for questions. Uh, so, Carol, I invite you to start us off by leading us in prayer. Thank you. And I am going to read a prayer from Education for Justice out of the Ignatian Solidarity Network. Uh, but before I do, I just want to mention uh, a quote from Laudato C. 139, where it talks when it speaks of environment here, it talks about a relationship existing between nature and the society which lives in it. And when we think of nature as Pope Francis uh, speaks to us in Laudato Si, we are part of nature, nature, environment, human beings. We're not separate from it, but we are a part of it. And so I was thinking of, um, this in relationship to our topic tonight, whose earth is it? And um, also this uh, prayer that talks about, I was looking at mother as um, earth or mother. We could look at mother in many different ways. Um, it comes from a prayer about the black Madonna. A mother of the darkness, of the deep, rich soil, that brings forth new growth. Bless all your children struggling for new ways of being community for each other. O oh, mother of the darkness of the infinite night sky that graces us with endless stars. Bless all your children looking for hope and light to pierce the present darkness. O oh, mother of the darkness of the creative womb that nurtures brilliant possibilities. Bless all your children seeking wisdom yet to be experienced on paths still opening before us. O oh, mother of the darkness, Black Madonna, Madre Negra, Sarjna Matka, who calls everyone in the human community my child, Bless us all and bring us all gift and grace as we reach out for each other's hands. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Carol. Very, very beautiful. Uh, many of us on uh, uh, the Zoom tonight are members of religious congregations, particularly congregations of women. And uh, all of us in the past few years have been probing uh, painfully our complicity in racism and the all pervasive racism and white privilege that taint 
even our best efforts in institutions. Uh, as you know, the Leadership Conference of Women Religious has been in inspiring us to approach all justice issues from the perspective of intersectionality, uh, the interrelationship of systems and structures of injustice and oppression. So we're delighted to have with us this evening, Dr. Juanza Eric Clark, uh, to help us investigate some of those intersections. Uh, Dr. Clark is Associate Professor of Global Christianity at Manhattan College, not too far from uh, uh, Riverdale, where Carol is. Uh, he holds a doctorate from Emory University. And most recently, he's author of a tremendous book from Orbis Press, uh, Reclaiming Stolen Earth, an African Ecotheology, which I encourage all of you to get and to read. It is truly a landmark book um, with filled with a brilliant new insights and a book that deserves serious attention and conversation. So we welcome uh, Dr. Clark and uh, we're anxious to uh, hear your presentation this evening. So take it away. <clears throat> okay, um, thank you, Father. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, so thank you to the various organizations for inviting me to uh, share uh, my newest project, which again is entitled Reclaiming Stolen Earth and Africana Ecotheology. Um, so the title of the lecture is really, is really an explanation of the book. Uh, the, the lecture is entitled Whose Earth Is It? Decolonizing Ecotheology. Uh, but it's really just me talking about the various arguments within my book in a, in a meaningful way. I know I won't have time to get through it in its entirety, so I'm gonna to try to highlight what I think are the important sections here. Um, so in a nutshell, what I'm trying to do is to have a conversation between black liberation theology and Christian eco-theology. I'm suggesting that they need to have a conversation and I want to bring um, indigenous religions into this conversation. So uh, the subtitle of the book in Africana Ecotheology is really, a re Africana is a, actually a reference not to African, but it's a reference to African uh, diasporic people. So people, not just the people on the continent of Africa, but people who are of African descent throughout the African diaspora. Uh, and a lot of my examples that I cited in the book come from, I have examples from, of, of, in terms of, land dispossession, examples from the continent of Africa, but also my own location, which is obviously North America. And, and as an African-American, I centralize, I'm gonna centralize my talk uh, around experiences of land theft and land dispossession in America, in North America. Okay, so James Cone, who was the, considered the father of black liberation theology, wrote a, a book chapter called Whose Earth Is It Anyway? And in this chapter, he argues that the logic of white supremacy is the same logic that leads to, leads to the destruction of the earth. And so while racial justice movements and ecological mo justice movements um, seem to be doing different things, they seem, seem to have different agendas, uh, what they don't realize, what Cohn says, is that they're actually engaged in a similar fight. They're actually engaged in the same fight. And so I'm, I, much of what the book is doing is building on some of the uh, claims that he makes in this article. But what I'm adding to his discussion, Cohn is a, is, is a traditional systematic uh, theologian, Christian theologian. Uh, and so he, he, what he says is that racial justice movements need to be more ecologically focused and ecologically justice move, ecological justice movements need to care more about racial justice and social justice. Um, what he doesn't say that I want to add to this discussion is that I think the linchpin that connects the two conversations is um, through a conversation with practitioners of indigenous religions, both African and Native American on the question of what does it mean to be human and what is the proper relationship between human beings and the rest of the natural world. 
In other words, what can indigenous religions teach us about ecological sustainability and viability? Cone sort of ends this, this chapter by saying that, quote, no one racial or national group, and I would add to this, no one religion, has all the answers. But all groups have something to contribute to the Earth's healing. All groups have something, and, I, and so by groups I'm including religions, various religions have something to contribute to the Earth's healing, end quote. Now, now I'm going to give you another quote here, and this this quote from Desmond Tutu sort of epitomizes uh, what what the, the the sentiment of this this conversation is going to be about. Desmond Tutu, who is the uh, Anglican Bishop of in South of South Africa, won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize in the '90s, um, early '90s. He's quoted as having said, "Quote: When the missionaries, when Christian missionaries came to Africa." They had the Bible and we had the land. They said, let us pray. We closed our eyes. When we opened them, we had the Bible and they had the land, end quote. Okay, so while that's obviously not, not intended to be taken literally, the sentiment of that, this idea of land theft, land dispossession and the role that the Christian faith the Christian religion played, Christian evangelism and missionaries played in that and um, European imperialism is really the essence or the core uh, feature of what the book gets at. So, so while, my, while I might engage in, a, in some jargon here in terms of theological jargon and talk, I want you to always come back to that quote because that quote is sort of the, the essence or the sentiment that I'm trying to unpack, right? So with native people, native peoples in Africa and in North America, right? We had the land, the land was taken from us in exchange for religion, right? We got the Bible in its place. Um, uh, and so, so let's unpack that a little bit, okay? All right. Um, so Sally McFaig is a uh, feminist and a Christian eco-theologian. She says that uh, our, quote, our sin is a failure to maintain our proper place. Um, she says we are not sinners because we rebel against God or are unable to be sufficiently spiritual. Our particular failing is our unwillingness to stay in our place to accept our proper limits so that other individuals of our species, as well as other species, can also have needed space, right? So our particular failing is our unwillingness to stay in our place, to accept our proper limits so that other individuals of our species, as well as other species, can also have needed space. She's inviting us to think about sin in spatial terms because of the, primarily because of the damage that we've wrought to the planet. And else, elsewhere in her work, she suggests a shift from a historical temporal orientation to a spatial orientation. And that's what I, that's, that shift from a, from a temporal to a spatial orientation is part of what my methodology is. And I wanna talk about that. So, so, but the problem with Sally McFaig is that she does this as a Christian eco-theologian. She does this without the slightest bit of irony or acknowledgement that indigenous religions, African and Native American religions, already saw the world in the way that she's describing. These cultures, these communities, these religions are spatially orient oriented before they were demeaned and denigrated by Western and European Christian imperialists and missionaries as savage, heathen, primitive, and uncivilized. And Western Christianity was used as a justification and rationalization, not only for their oppression, but for conquest and dispossession of the land that they inhabited first. 
This happened in North America, as we will talk about a little bit in terms of the Native Americans, but also in different parts of Africa and Latin America as well, Latin and South America. So, so let me, so in the first chapter of the book, what I, what I do is go into detail about the differences in Western culture and these indigenous communities in terms of time and space. Western culture is informed by a temporal orientation. What do I mean by that? I mean that it pri obviously uh, it prioritizes time over space. So in all cultures, obviously all human beings are bound by space and time configurations or limitations or restrictions. Uh, but Western culture prioritizes time, whereas these indigenous cultures prioritize space. Now, Vine Deloria, who is a Native American scholar, laments that, quote, Western, Euro European, Western European peoples have never learned to consider the nature of the world discerned from a spatial point of view. And then another Native American scholar talks about how in Euro-American and uh, European philosophical and theological history, it is most common to see intellectual, intellectual reflections on the meaning of time, while it is far less common to see intellectual reflections on space. Hence, progress, terms like progress, history, development, evolution, become key notions that invade all academic discourse in the West, from science to economics to philosophy and also theology. We're a culture bound by time that prioritizes time. If you think about it, we, we measure our productivity based on temporal considerations. How many hours did you work? Getting paid by the hour, right? I, I'm a, a college professor. So college professors are always talking to their students about using your time effectively. Okay, we're, we're culture bound by time or controlled where we're time, time is the controlling factor. Even with this talk that I'm giving right now, I'll, I'll always say this, that even with this talk, I'm bound by time restraints, right? I'm not permitted to talk just as long as I would like, right? We're, we have, we have things we have to do. We have to wrap this up. We can't, can't sit on a zoom call, you know, as long as perhaps we would like, right? We're bound by time. Now, in, in religious studies, a temporal orientation resulted in certain theological and religious ideas being deemed primitive, like non-Western ideas. And Western ideas, like, like mono, the idea that monotheism is the most evolved, uh, uh, were, were deemed more advanced. So the idea is that what comes later is viewed as more advanced than what preceded it, okay, in religious studies. Thus, thus later civilizations and culture are deemed more evolved, more advanced than so-called primitive or primal or early uh, civilizations. And so even, even with religious studies texts today, even if you, if you get a religious studies text uh, when they talk about Native American and African indigenous, indigenous religions, invariably they will use the word primal or primitive to describe them, which is why it's often difficult for me to find a useful uh, religious studies text. Um, so what comes later is often, is, is often viewed as more advanced than what preceded it. Now with Christian theology, while the, the, this is true to a certain extent with the, with the focus on the eschaton and the, and the eschatology and the afterlife. But Christian theology is all, uh, also focused on a past time, right? And so the, the, time, um, the time that the Bible chronicles, the first century and before, is the time that's deemed more important, where God revealed what's most important to us, happened long ago, happened 2,000 years ago plus, right? This is, and so, and so, for example, what is Easter about? We celebrated Easter a couple a month ago or so, right? Uh, it, what is Easter? A memorializing of what happened in the first century for the last week 
right? Passover, uh, uh, Passion Week, Good Friday, and then Easter. So we, 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 we go back and replay what happened in the first century. The, and so theology, I'm saying, puts a premium on a pastime. But what if theology were to prioritize our current spaces, our present time, and the spaces that we currently exist within? What would that do to, to theology as a discipline? That's what the, the book is trying to wrestle with that in terms of what an Africana eco-theology might look like. So that's the, the first chapter is trying to unpack the difference between a temporal orientation and a spatial one. Vine Deloria, who I've quoted before, I'm gonna come back to him now. He asserts that quote, spatial thinking requires that ethical systems be related directly to the physical world and real human situations, not abstract principles believed to be valid at all times and under all circumstances. If time is our primary consideration, we never seem to arrive at the reality of our existence in places, but instead are always directed to experiential and abstract interpretations rather than to the experiences themselves, end quote. Okay, so that's what chapter one is trying to unpack. So, so in chapter two, I, what I try to do is explain, and really for the rest of the book, is try to explain how we, how might we look at uh, the the um, the history of white supremacy in in uh, the western part of the world, racial oppression of African descended people. What does that look like in spatial terms? with a focus on land dispossession and land theft, okay? And then in a lot of chapters, I try to talk about the ways in which Christianity uh, might incorporate concepts from certain indigenous religions. And I try to address this, uh, this need to be more spatially oriented and be responsive to the problem of the ecological crisis. And so in chapter two, I start off by talking about how indigenous African ways of perceiving the earth are different than the traditional Western understanding of, of the earth and land. Land particularly is where my focus is in this text. Indigenous African ways of uh, perceive the earth as alive, as possessing spiritual power versus the idea of private property. Indigenous African perspectives view the land as a living reality and as an extension. I think I heard somebody say earlier, and maybe that was in the prayer, that the that human beings are an extension of the land, of the earth. The goal of human existence is to, is in this context, is to become an ancestor. And ancestors are believed to reside in the, in the invisible realm, but they're believed to reside in the natural world. So the, the natural world then becomes sacred space, sacred spaces. Now in the Western world, uh, and I'm generalizing here a bit, but in the Western world, mostly, not entirely, but mostly views land or has tended to view land as a commodity to be bought and sold to generate capital. So John Locke, who's a, obviously an English, English philosopher, ties the notion of private property to individual labor. He says that if a man worked the land himself, and I and specifically he's referring to men, if a man worked the land himself and turned it into something that was productive, then, he, then the idea was that he was entitled to that, to own it. He was entitled to that land because he was able to make the land productive. Now, now, Interestingly enough, as you might imagine, this, this idea of making the land productive didn't apply to people of color who were by, or the indigenous folk who were by and large deemed uncivilized and primitive. So that part of what I'm alluding to here, trying to make a claim is that the, the commodification of the land is tied to, or is an extension of the commodification of people right? People deemed primitive, people deemed less than human. 
And so the, I, I focus in most of this chapter on the legacy of stolen earth and land dispossession, not just the most obvious example of this is, is what was ha what how we treated the Native Americans, right? The Trail of Tears, putting them on reservations, taking uh, the land through manifest destiny, et cetera. Um, so that's obvious and clear, but, but this also happened to African-Americans and this is where I focus a lot of my attention. Um, through African African American spatial dislocation. So the very presence of African Americans represents spatial dislocation, right? Being brought forcibly brought from Africa through the transatlantic slave trade. Okay. So you have the institution of chattel slavery. Uh, but then, but but where I'm focused is what happens after slavery ends, after the Civil War, after Reconstruction. <clears throat> There was a second dispossession that occurred after slavery, mostly in the early 20th century in America, when hard earned land was stolen, often following white supremacist violence and lynchings. Okay, and so there's a term called white capping. White capping is specifically the, this idea of of forcing a person of color, forcing the African-American specifically to abandon his home or property through mm -hmm. violence and coercion. In other words, driving black people off land that they own. That's what white capping is. This happened throughout the South. Um, and because I'm, I'm from the South, I'm, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and so while I could focus, uh, and in the book I focus on several examples from Kentucky, Arkansas, Mississippi, but I want to talk specifically about one scenario that happened uh, about uh, 80 miles from where I'm from. It's, a, it's a, a place called Forsyth County, Georgia. So in For Forsyth County, Georgia in 1912, um, there was a, a African-Americans who lived in this community were forcibly expelled from the community and forced to abandon their land. How did this happen? I won't go into all the details, but let me sort of summarize the story for you if I can for a moment. So uh, uh, there was a white woman who was, um, who alleged that three black men raped her. Uh, and they, they immediately imprisoned or, or jailed one of the men. Okay, and so he was in jail, but before he could receive any kind of due process or anything like that, there was a, a white lynch mob that came to the jail. They got him out of the jail, immediately beat him, uh, lynched him, shot him, and killed him. Um, so he was lynched. Now, as a consequence of this, um, someone started a rumor because this person, well, well, let me just say, subsequently the other two men were later lynched as well, but, but I'm focused on the first man because his lynching led to the expulsion of these black residents. After the lynching of the first man, first black man, um, a rumor was started that there were black people in, an, in another community that had heard word of the lynching and wanted to retaliate through violence. And so they were gathering guns and ammunition and they were gonna come to Forsyth County and wreak revenge for the death of the man who was lynched. Now this was entirely speculation and, and it was unfounded, never proven. There was no such organized uh, black mob being formed. But the mere idea, suggestion of that generated such fear that the response was to expel through force all of the 1,100 Black residents who lived in Forsyth County. So, so that lynching led to a greater mass, uh, a mob, where the 1,100 Black residents were forced to abandon their churches, their farms, their homes, and obviously all of that property that they owned and forced to leave um, Forsyth County. This was in 1912. 
And so that's just one example among many that often happens in many places in the South. And so there's a quote that says, uh, or there's a saying at the town that says, if you're looking for stolen black land, just follow the lynching trail. So instance at the instance of lynchings leading to land forfeiture, land dispossession occurred time and time again. Um, now, just to sort of wrap up this, this Forsyth story a bit, um, the reason why I focused on that is because 75 years later, uh, in 1987, I was a, I was, I think I was 12 years old. I, was, I, this was on the news a lot in 1987. Hosea Williams, who was, who used to march with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, he was trying to organize a march 75 years later back to Forsyth County to try to expose some of this uh, racial history. To offer, you know, obviously he was informed by King's emphasis on nonviolence. And he was just trying to do something that could spark racial reconciliation between the, the Black community and Forsyth County. And so he tried to organize the march in 1987. He was met by, with swastika signs and with uh, signs that said, Forsyth's security is its racial purity. Okay. And so he, he, he was, they were practicing, and we were talking about a small group of peaceful marchers that were practically run back out of town. This was 75 years later. So, so I mentioned that just to say, and when we talk about attitudes not having changed much uh, in all that time in terms of the perception of uh, African-Americans. Uh, and so that's why I focus on that story a lot in the book. Now, so, so let me move along here. So the, um, uh, so there was this, we talked, perhaps you've heard of the great migration where African American, because of this legacy of racial violence in the South, there was this, was known as the great migration North that occurred to uh, not have to be exposed to Jim Crow segregation and violence. Uh, but, but if we look at that, migration, that mi migration is usually lauded as a positive, but if we look at that in spatial terms, what actually happens is a migration north to cities like New York City, Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., that, that uh, African-Americans, when they went north, were forced into sort of much smaller urban dwellings in, in slums or projects uh, where there was limited spatial, there was a rigid sort of spatial confinement and where law enforcement could hyper surveil and monitor the behaviors in those communities. So if you think about, um, if you think about racism in spatial terms, not only is the land that's lost, but this, this migration north leads to uh, limited spatial confinement, spatial restrictions and hyper surveillance by the police who wanna, in, in fact, in, in Chicago, the, the the organizing attitude of police at this time was to help pro white people protect themselves and to wall off themselves from these black people who were coming north trying to seek protection from racial racial violence. So that's the animating feature, and obviously, uh, you know, uh, issues with the police continue to this day. Um, but it's the it's this idea that that at least in Chicago, and I have several quotes in the chapter about this, where the whole idea is that white people need their property protected from these uh, Blacks who are really, uh, uh, you know, seeking protection from racial violence in the South. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so, so, um, so let, me, let me move on here. I don't know how much time I have left here. I haven't really even gotten to much of what I want to say. Um, can I do a check-in in terms of the time? Am I okay, Father? I have about uh, 25 minutes. Oh, okay, okay, so I'm, I'm fine. Uh, all right, so I gave you those examples from North America um, um, to say that, what, what, why am I talking about this? I'm suggesting that 
Um, indigenous people had a different view of the land and the earth in terms of when we say whose earth is it in terms of what has happened, what what is the this destruction that uh, or this deterioration, this ecological deterioration that we've brought, who's been in charge of the earth? That's why that's that's what Cohn is 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 suggesting when he asks whose earth is it anyway? Who's been in charge of the earth? What ideas have been allowed to flourish? How has the earth been perceived uh, that's led to this kind of ecological crisis we find ourselves in today? So is we, we can't universalize this problem the way that Western eco-theologians want to do without some acknowledgement of how we got into this situation. Uh, and, 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 and the idea is that these suppressed subjugated voices have something to add to this conversation to help turn this uh this planetary crisis around for us now now i won't go into detail about uh, the uh, instances of land dispossession in africa uh, but i cite examples from west africa where i focus on ghana um, and then south africa is probably one that we're more familiar with, with the legacy of white settler colonialism in South Africa, the legacy of apartheid. The same thing happens. That Desmond Tutu quote that I cited earlier uh, is, is, a, is a reference to uh, land loss, land dispossession, and how the natives were forced to, much like Native Americans in our country forced on re reservations, Native Africans in South Africa were forced on homelands, which is another way to describe reservations, right? And during the apartheid era, they weren't even considered citizens of the country. They were citizens of these, these miniature homelands, right? So it's almost exactly how we treat Native Americans. Um, uh, and that, so that's, that what, and so the Dutch and the British combined to create South African whites who control the land. Now, obviously we know that's, that since 1991, when Nelson Mandela was free from prison, that apartheid has, has fallen. They've had um, uh, uh, Native Africans to lead the country. However, what has not changed is the spatial configurations of the country, right? Most African people still live, they don't call them homelands anymore, but they still live in townships. They still live in, in impoverished situations. And the white minority controls the land, the vast majority of the land uh, to this day. So the, while the politics have changed in terms of who's allowed to vote, who's allowed to, to be a citizen, um, the, the land and the power dynamics have not, the spatial configurations, I should say, have not changed since the apartheid era. So I talk about that. So I, I'm making an a, a argument for why this is not a... It's not a North American problem. It's not just a South African problem. This has happened many places around the globe and has had an impact on terms of how we treated the land. Um, okay, so then, so what do I say? Um, I'm not, I, again, I'm not, I can't go through every chapter, but uh, I do want to say that. Um, in terms of the Christian response, I, I make a couple of suggestions, and then I want to talk about some practical things that communities, religious communities are doing in terms of, of reclaiming land, since the title of the book is Reclaiming Stolen Earth. So the first thing I'll say is that I, in terms of biblical interpretation, I, I, there's a section in chapter four where I talk about the role of the Bible. Um, and I say that the Bible, the Bible um, should not be read as the objective word of God, um, because to read it that way, especially for oppressed people, people who have historically been oppressed, is to read it in a way where the, the reader is forced to identify with the quote unquote heroes, heroes of scripture. Uh, and when you identify with the heroes of scripture, then you're going to uh, then it, it leads to often to a, a failure to be critical of the of the patriarchy that's in the text, but also the ways in which people who are not the protagonists of scripture 
are deemed as inferior and less than and maybe deserving of mistreatment. Um, and so, for example, uh, Black theologians and womanist theologians like to talk a lot about the Exodus narrative. And, and there's a long legacy of, it's going all the way back to slavery, of enslaved Africans identifying with the story of Moses and, and how Moses, God, Moses is the great liberator. And God spoke to him and told him to go to Pharaoh and let my people go. Right. So there's a, and a, you know, a lot of spirituals are rooted in that story. Black theology and black and womanist theology build on that. This, in fact, James Cone says, in addition to Jesus, this story in the Old Testament about Exodus is what proves that God is on the side of the oppressed. Okay. The problem with this story, however, uh, and it's what some Dolores Williams famously has talked about in her book, uh, Sisters in the Wilderness is that we tend not to tell the entire story, right? So we focus on what she says that Cone and Black theologians focus on Exodus as an event of liberation. That's really just to focus on the first part of the story, right? Being slaves and God leading them out of uh, oppression in Egypt, across the Red Sea and to the wilderness for 40 years. But what we felt we often don't talk about is the back half of that story when they uh, go into the pr the promised land, the land promised to them to them by God, but there were already people living there, right? So there were Canaanites in the land of Canaan, and so Native American theologians often talk about the uh, either being the Canaanites either being killed or being forced to assimilate Hebrew culture. Okay. So, so what William says is that Black theologians are telling half of the story. They're talking about the Exodus as an event, but not as a holistic story. Uh, and, it's, and Native American scholars say, and I agree with this for, in terms of the African-American experience, is that African-Americans and Native Americans actually have more in common with the Canaanites than they do with the conquering uh, Hebrews who come in and take the land, right? Um, and in fact, some women scholars will 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 admit that this is the this story is what in part um, the appropriation of this story is what accounts for America, right? Uh, uh, the Pilgrims and the Puritans and others coming here to create a new promised land, a city on the hill that becomes America. It's the same logic, so. You talk about, they, they'll expose that and talk about that as problematic, yet yet African-Americans are, are supposed to identify with the very story that's being critiqued as condoning, not condoning genocide, but cert, certainly a story that, that's, that we can read um, through the lens of genocide and condoning oppression at the very least. Um, so, so, so this is why I say, and um, there's a biblical scholar named uh, Randall Bailey who says that we have to have a freedom of interpretation when it comes to the text. You can't read the text as the objective word of God um, because then what that means is that you have to minimize your own lived experience because of who you are made to have to identify with in scripture. Right, the heroes of scripture, as it were. So, if we have a freedom of an, a subversive reading of the text, uh, 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 a freedom of interpretation might might invite us to be suspicious and to question even the motives of the biblical authors in stories like the Exodus uh, and the conquest of Canaan, and and whether we should affirm that. Uh, as a story, or whether that should continue to hold the weight and the value of uh, that it has in the past. Um, so, so that's just one example. Randall Bailey goes into a lot of detail about other biblical stories um, that maybe need to be interpreted subversively, uh, much in the way that Howard Thurman famously wrote of, in, in uh, the G uh, um, Jesus in the Disinherited. He talked about his grandmother who was an enslaved African who could not read 
uh, or write, but encouraged Harold Thurman to read. And so when he would read the Bible to her, she would say, don't read those passages from the Apostle Paul, where he talked about slaves being obedient to your masters, that that because the slave master would always read those texts. And she essentially said those texts have no spiritual value or authority to me. So you, you cannot read that to me. Right. So it's, so in her own way, what she was saying was she was offering this kind of subversive reading uh, of scripture where it, the entire text can't carry equal weight. Right. There's certain texts that carry more weight. Uh, and so we have to learn how to read the text subversively in a way that speaks to our lived present experiences. Um, and not some abstract idea of what truth is separate and apart from our lived experiences. OK. All right. So that's one thing I would to say about the, the, uh, the biblical text. I have a whole nother uh conversation I, I have in the text about the cross and the legacy of the cross and how black Christians acceptance of the cross and the idea of redemptive suffering has led to more suffering. Um, so I'm sort of critical of the, the, the continuing use of the cross as a uh, uh, absolute symbol. I say that it's become an idol in a lot of black Christian churches. Um, and even I'm even critical of how Dr. King uh, talked about the cross and redemptive suffering and the need for more black blood to spill in order to achieve equality through nonviolence in America. So, so, but that's another conversation. That I, I'll sort of end here a little bit. Um, well, I'm coming to an end. I just wanna, I wanna talk about practical things. So instead of just talking about what the problem is, let me let me share some information regarding what certain communities are doing in terms of reclaiming stolen earth, reclaiming earth. So there's a legacy, and this dates back to the 60s, Fannie Lou Hamer, who is from Mississippi, famously started what she called Freedom Farms. She she called it the Freedom Farms in Mississippi, where she was able as a to start a cooperative farm of excuse me of seven hundred acres uh, in rural Mississippi, and she did this out of necessity because in the late sixties, mid sixties, uh, African Americans in rural Mississippi were were uh, actually faced with the prospect of starvation because of not just because of the racism because of the because of the racism because of the poverty because of the lack of access uh, to food and so she started this out of necessity but she intended this to be a type of black self-determination project where it would um, be a farm that could provide food but also much needed housing um, uh, and also provide jobs Right, so at its peak, um, I think this this farm, this freedom farm, employed fifteen hundred people. It housed about uh, five hundred. Uh, well, it it fed over five hundred families at one point. Uh, at its peak, uh, it was very much dependent on the charity and generosity and uh, uh, donations of white benefactors, who subsequently uh, decided not to provide those funds or to take those funds back. Uh, and then there were some seasonal issues with the farm in terms of the bull weevil and drought. And so, and also Fannie Lou Hamer's uh, uh, waning health contributed to the project ultimately falling apart. But it said, so, the, so but Fannie Lou, Fannie Lou Hamer's Freedom Farm set a precedent for uh, ideas about how to reclaim earth through acts, projects of self-determination, right? And so Melanie Harris, who's an eco-womanist, talks about ecological reparations, that the reparations for oppressed people uh, have to include what we might call ecological reparations, but this is not where necessarily where you're expecting 
the federal government or somebody to give land back as much as start the process of reclaiming yourselves through cooperation, through communities coming together to organize, to do such things. And so there's um, a couple of religious communities I wanna talk about briefly. One is the Shrines of the Black Madonna. It's a, it's a the Pan-African Orthodox Christian church. They have churches in Detroit, uh, Atlanta, Houston, and then they have a farm in Abbeville, South Carolina, a 4,000 acre farm. Now, what's important to know about this farm is that um, almost a hundred years prior to the church purchasing this farm, in 1916, a fellow by the name of Anthony Crawford owned 500 acres. He was a he was a black man who owned 500 acres of of farm in the same community in the same town. Um, and because he was a successful black person, there was. Uh, uh, a, a lot of jealousy of him at the time from whites. Uh, he was through some so, sort of subterfuge uh, argument was was provoked with him that became a justification for lynching him. And so he also was lynched and his land was stolen from him and his family. Okay, so I mentioned that because a hundred years later, uh, uh, this black church has has purchased in the same town in the same area 4,000 acres of, of farmland as a type of sort of healing spirit act of spiritual renewal uh, and they have you know poor libations and acknowledge the spirit and the death of Anthony Crawford um, and are trying to so that's part of the ritual practice of paying paying homage to him and his legacy, and also trying to reclaim the space, to indigenize the space. They're using it in ways that are uh, farming, eco-friendly farming. Uh, they're engaging in solar farming as well, to, and, and, uh, and medicinal plant, medicinal farming in terms of how they use the land in addition to just providing agriculture and, and things like that. Um, so, so that's one example. They're, they're, they're a church, a Christian community, a Protestant community, but they incorporate uh, an Africana perspective or African-centered perspective into how they approach farming and community. It's a, it's a, and uh, communalism is what informs their perspective as well, as opposed to uh, having a capitalistic uh, approach. So that's one, one group. And the idea of Beulah is called Beulah Land Farms, but the idea is that that this they would just have the one farm, but they would create Beulah lands in in the United States, outside the United States, throughout the Pan African world. So that's their sort of goal, and it's one example of ways of trying to reclaim Earth and heal Earth. The last example I'll give is a, is an Afro Indigenous farm in upstate New York, some of you may have heard of, of um, 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 Soul Fire Farms is what it's called. And uh, Leah Penniman is the uh, head, the, the, the manager of the farm. She's also a practitioner, a, a ordained uh, a, a voodoo priestess. Um, and so she, they engage in traditional African practices, farm practices, uh, and also consult the spirits of the land before they make any major moves in terms of how to treat the land. So they, they are, through their indigenous religious practices, are engaging uh, in acts of recovery and incorporating some of these, in, these indigenous ideas into, into uh, how they farm how they treat the land. They also acknowledge, uh, when I was there, we, uh, they talked to me a lot about how they acknowledge the original inhabitants who were displaced and now the uh, indigenous tribe, the indigenous group that once owned or resided on that land were displaced. And I think they're somewhere in, in upstate Michigan or somewhere now, but she says that periodically they will, they will grow the, the central uh, food that that, that, that uh, indigenous community was known for and send them um, 
barrels of that food just as, as a way to acknowledge that they were the original inhabitants of the earth uh, of that particular land and they wanted to pay homage to them. So they're in communication with them uh, even, even as they uh, try to carve out uh, new spaces and efforts to address food insecurity in Albany. Um, uh, so that's the that's the that's the Soul Fire Farm. So I cite both of them, both of those examples, as as sort of living out the legacy of Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, and so and so you say, what can we do? What um, what can churches do? This is this is part of what can be done to sort of uh, to salvage the space, to recover the space, to indigenize. That's really ultimately the goal is that the, the, the legacy of this is the failure to indigenize space, what it has wrought for the planet. And so by indigenizing, by incorporating some of these ideas, we can, re, we can reclaim the space and in so doing begin the process, the slow process of trying to heal the earth little by little. Um, and so that's ultimately what the, what the book is about. I could say more about uh, how this, this spatial conception of thinking uh, forces us to reimagine how we conceptualize God. And so, and so uh, based on African mysticism, that's another conversation uh, um, that a lot of these churches are incorporating in and an African mystical, African mystical conception of God, God not as an uh, as an independent supreme being or agent, but as cosmic energy and power that we need to plug into, as opposed to someone that we pray to. So that was that's I didn't talk a lot about that, but I suppose I could can maybe we'll save that for questions and answers if people have concerns about that or thoughts about that. So I think I will. Stop there if my time is almost up and uh, invite you to ask questions. Thank you Thank very you. much, uh, Juanza, for that uh, rich and provocative and thought provoking presentation. And um, uh, as he said, we're, uh, we have some time now for questions or, or dialogue or um, just what uh, uh, you've heard evokes in your spirit and in your mind and in your own relationship with land. So let's just take a, about a minute of quiet uh, to let some of this settle in and to let some thoughts arise in us, and then we'll have time for sharing. Okay, uh, Juwan, so somebody put a question in the chat, uh, exactly what you said. Please say more about God as cosmic energy uh, power. Um, okay, so there are, I, I mentioned that church, uh, this Shrine of the Black Madonna, they, they were founded by uh, Albert Clay Jr., who's also considered a founder of uh, Black Liberation Theology. Um, and he is the one who I talk about in chapter three as, uh, as offering what I'm calling an African mystical conception of God. Um, and then I also highlight uh, a, a leader in Ghana, West Africa, 
who is a who leads an African indigenous African initiated church in West Africa, which I've also visited. And what they're both attempting to do is to address uh, African people's sort of acceptance of or, or internalized racism or their internalized acceptance of, of black or African inferiority um, and, and, and the role that religion has in perpetuating that. In so doing, they don't know each other, but in so doing, they have both arrived at a similar conception of God as, as the, the notion that God is a supreme being um, that we must uh, uh, sort of make petitions to, a separate entity that's transcendent, that looks down um, and sort of judges us, right? Um, it has been ruled out as a conception. That's a, a, a conception of God that's tied into notions of, of whiteness he talks about. And so an African mystical conception of God is doesn't see God in that way, that God is, is, is a term um, in theology we call a panentheistic conception of God, that God is God is in all. All is in God, I should say. All is in God. So it's a version of pantheism, not the same as pantheism, but it's this idea that God exists in us and all around us as a force field, as an energy, as as a as cosmic intelligence that we can tap into. And so, and so I quote Clay at length in chapter three, but he has this term where he talks about worship. The worship experience needs to be about this idea that we can plug into God. We come together as a community. And through our ritual, through our worship experience, try, try to tap into or plug into God. And that energy and that spirit is what uh, uh, brings us together to fight for change, to fight for transformation of our community, um, uh, to fight for, for social transformation. Um, and, so, and so it's a con conception of God that ties salvation to the here and now. So. The other thing I didn't say was that that this conception of God is also consistent with a, a spatial way of viewing reality, a spatial configuration where God is present at every waking moment uh, in our in our current spaces, right? Not something we have to look back necessarily to the first century for. Doesn't mean that we don't we don't uh, reference Jesus, because what Clegg would say is that God was incarnate in Jesus but not in a way that God can't be incarnate in each one of us. And so that's uh, really the conception of God that he had and that I, and also the, the gentleman in um, West Africa, uh, I talk about both of them as examples of uh, conceptions of God that are, that prioritize our current spaces uh, as opposed to a temporal, more temporal understanding of God. I think I'll stop there with that. If I may, Terry um, and Dr. Clark, I just, I'm thinking about how brilliant it is to understand this difference between space and time. And I just wondered, I mean, like it makes perfect sense. I mean, all the prayers that we know of native prayers, you know, that connects us to the earth to anyway I just wonder was there like an aha moment in your life when this like came to you or was it something that you've you know I don't know how you came to understand that that was so powerful and thank you very much oh yeah so so thank you um actually I have been Sort of wrestling with this. I was first first exposed to this at, as an undergraduate uh, at Morehouse College, and I remember being in a class where this idea was proposed or put. I can't remember what class it was now, um, actually, but um, but I remember the idea of that. Uh, how in these communities, the indigenous communities prioritize space, and this whole spatial orientation I'm talking about now. And I, I wrestled with that because then I went on to seminary where I was given, you know, trained in the more traditional systematic thought um, and kind of lost 
kind of lost contact with that. But I, but it's always always been something I was wrestling with. How how can I talk about this uh, in a way that's sort of because I I'm a black theologian, so I was trying to connect it with with race. Um, and I realized that this 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 turn towards indigenous spirituality is the way to get there with that. So that's that it really just kind of all came together. And I don't know how well I because there's a lot of ideas, you know, happening in a few chapters here. So I don't know um, how well I did that, pull that all together. But it's yeah, it's been something I've been wrestling with for for a while and trying to figure out exactly how to connect the dots between. Uh, black liberation theology and African theology and eco theology. I'm, I'm wondering. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if the the strength of this argument, this the strength of this concept, is is matched by the difficulty in actually putting it into operation. There are so many people who are talking about cooperatives from uh, Denise Abdul Rahman, who talks about communities actually owning the power sources in, in unit. And that's, that's such a big movement. And yet connecting that and bringing it back to what is the simplest idea of community and collective, which we have lost in which the indigenous and the tribal and all cultures grew up with. We are the ones, the white Europeans are the ones who, who destroyed those connections. And now bringing it back together is imperative, but it is daunting. It's daunting to, to operationalize it. No, I think you're absolutely right about that. Um... Yeah, uh, because I think this the sort of neoliberal uh, assumptions uh, um, and um, are so deeply rooted. The sort of capitalistic assumptions are taken for granted, um, and I think and this is part of what I think the role of philosophy and theology is: is to sort of get at that. Because uh, in other disciplines, other disciplines sort of assume those things as their starting place, mm -hmm. uh, especially especially economics and you know. Right, so uh, even history, like a, a lot of those other disciplines, assume a certain certain starting place that's rooted in individualism and competition, uh, et cetera. So, 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 right. So, I, 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 just to echo what you're saying, I, I agree it's a daunting task, but, uh, but to your point, I think it's, this is why it's important to highlight. The efforts that community, certain communities have, have have tried to do, and not just be entirely theoretical. This is what I'm trying to right. do in the fifth, the fifth chapter is to talk about there are people who are trying to do this, and we need to to lift them up and and, and contribute mm -hmm. to their to their efforts. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mary Ellen. You have your hand up. Um, I I've just really really appreciated your presentation. It, it's just it's just really wonderful to to think in terms of of that spatial piece, and I and I'm thinking about in, in a very practical way about and and your comments Anne about the the cooperatives, because of the doctrine of discovery, and mm. how all of our real estate laws in this in this country are based on that. I'm I'm wondering if if you've thought about what what might be some ways to um, uh, to work with that or work to get rid of the doctrine of discovery so that we really can think about the land as it, it belongs to um, who it belongs to and not be and not be um, limited by by real estate law mm. yeah. Yeah, no, that's again, that's very, it's very daunting. I do talk about the document yeah. discovery. No, thanks. I, I have. Hello. I didn't uh, mention that in my presentation, but you're you're absolutely right. How much? Oh, of I don't it think is. I have this. No, oh, we don't have. Okay. 
Thanks. <laughs> No, you're absolutely right about how much of it is rooted in that. So, oh, um, um, I was kind of lost my train of thought there. Can you just, can you remind me a bit of what you are, what you wanted me to respond to? Well, I'm I'm just thinking about the the doctrine of discovery. I mean, and that's that's our Catholic tradition, um, mm -hmm. and how um, our our capitalist laws in this country. The real right. estate laws um, are are based on that doctrine of discovery, and and how can we really be fair and honest with with the yeah. the land in, in being able to return it to whom it belongs, or make it possible that there's more access to it? Right. No. Absolutely. Right. So this is what I was thinking when I when I talked about ecological reparations. What that 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 again that's not just the government giving land back i think that that can be a part of the conversation but there there needs to be different components of what what ecological repair uh looks like in this country and and so and so um i do think the government has a role to play in sort of acknowledging uh, uh this legacy and this history and the doctrine of discovery as you as you highlighted but 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 people who believe in this alternative worldview have to also have to also take it upon themselves to repair the earth and not wait for some kind of formal acknowledgement. So I, I guess what I'm saying is it has to be a both and that's happening at the same time, and then also private entities uh, doing what they can to 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 bring about ecological repair in ways that don't necessarily mean, you know, we're going to give this amount of land to this person of color necessarily, but how can we, uh, you know, institute more communal forms of engagement with the earth and connection with the earth and living that sort of undercuts this neoliberal capitalistic perspective that we continue to just sort of assume and take for granted. So so it's, it's a complicated uh, thing, but I think that everybody has to do something to contribute to the uh, ecological repair in the various ways that they can. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Joan, as you were talking, I was thinking of uh, how in Western Christianity, we had land that was sacred too. But it was it was never all the earth or all the land. It was little parcels that we called churches that we could control. And uh, you know, the Eucharist was sacred bread. Not all bread was sacred. Just uh, some special bread that we had control of. Some special water that was holy. Not all water. Uh, mm. And how it turned. Uh, and how it dovetails with capitalism that. You know, in capitalism, the land doesn't have any value in itself until it can be turned into capital. Uh, right. And how the two of them went together uh, and how hard it is to exercise ourselves of those uh, uh, demons that we're possessed by in, in Western culture. Uh, I, I thought of the image, too, of how horrified people were a few years ago watching Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris on fire. Mm. Uh, but there are, you know, acres and acres of, of uh, rainforest on fire every day. And um, that's just the way things are. Uh, no one no one is in, in shock or in horror. So um, what I loved about your talking about your book is how deep it goes into, it's not just a matter of doing things more greenly. It's a real conversion of the way we relate to, um, to earth, to land. Uh, and to other creatures. So uh, uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, a good synthesis of what I was trying to get at uh, in the text. So I, I, I thank you for that. We can collaborate on your next one. <laughs> I think Elena has been waiting. Yeah, Elena, you have your hand up? No, I don't No, Can you hear me? Because yes. uh, I'm hooked up to a TV. Yes. Um, so when you talked about uh, the land versus time, uh, I'm a I'm a chemist, and uh, 
it's so I began thinking about reactions. And so if you think about a fire, that's a reaction. And but it goes to completion. If if you think about the land or in if you're living in the land, you're living constantly in an equilibrium. The, if if you're living not in our land, but um if if you were uh looking at um prescribed burns or looking at what the soil might need at some point in time. And then I just kind of began to think about our entire body is in homeostasis and we don't live in homeostasis with our world. Um, mm -hmm. Our bodies need to make something at some point and they need to suppress it. And we just don't live that way because in Western thinking, uh, scientific thinking, if nothing else, we think only of one direction and not mm -hmm. the fact that we only have any kind of equilibrium when we're looking at how both directions are happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that extractive kind of thing gets, um, you have to think about it in just a whole other way. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with that. That was that was a good way to you were speaking about just emphasis on linear, the sort of linear projection moving forward constantly without any sense of uh, how to maintain balance and equilibrium in the current spaces. And so that was part of what I was trying to get at in terms of always moving forward, always being forward looking and. And in terms of Western culture, that's that's good for producing technology and 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 uh, you know uh, advancements in technology. But these indigenous communities, which again are deemed primitive for not being technologically focused, uh, are now the ideas from those communities are what eco theologians are now talking about what needs to happen to save the earth. So that's that's also the piece is like. The irony of that, the, the, the very places deemed primitive are now, now it's ideas being taken from them without, not that they're doing it intentionally, but they, but in the ideas that they're suggesting, it is a turn back to what was former and what was deemed, you know, less than uh, and uncivilized and uncultured. So that's, um, that's, that's part of the point I'm trying to make. Let's, let's have some accountability uh, and not just sort of rush to a new technological solution to try to solve the problem um, of climate change, uh, because it, what what might be necessary is not to do more, but to do less uh, than what we've been doing. I don't want to, I don't want to ask a question if there are other ones, but I just wanted to footnote to Mary Ellen. Now that the Pope has repudiated the doctrine of discovery, that opens up so much legal battles yeah. and so much discussion over how do we put pressure on the Vatican? How do we put pressure on lawyers to pursue the idea that if, the, if that doctrine of 1495 Three is now repudiated. What is the ramifications in Supreme Court decisions right now about the Navajo Nation and other other places? It's just a, a, a very practical legal push that could be mounted. Anyone we haven't heard from? Um, maybe I'll just briefly say, because uh, um, I was trying to type it. And, um, thank you so very much, Juanza, because I personally, I found your um, sharing your conversation and the questions certainly um, and answers just really uh, very valuable. And I feel, because I am a member of Sister Charity of New York and uh, certainly Roar, religious organizations along the river and um, Metro New York Catholic Climate Movement, the groups that are sponsoring this and my work with Terry and uh, the Sisters of Charity of St. Elizabeth. Um, 
I really feel what you said brought together a lot of different things that we have been emphasizing trying to do. But what for me, what you've done is you really have helped kind of highlight certain things. So for instance, um, in our work with trying to uncover our own racist tendencies and um, trying to address racism, I personally have never really thought of the lynching and connecting it with the loss of land. So that was really, uh, you're giving us that example. That that really said a lot to me. And I like the way you have framed this, this idea of um, the uh, reclaiming the land and certainly our government may be taking responsibility, but how each one of us and maybe in the groups we're working with or the organizations we belong to, the congregations, how might we um, 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 move this along? And so for instance, it's a very concrete thing. We can't always look back, but Roar many years ago in the, in the early 2000s, we did a great um, handbook on land use. And because of our, um, our being immersed in the uh, the new story and, and Thomas Berry's work and seeing ourselves as part of this 13.8 billion year history, uh, very much we were asking ourselves and our congregations to say, we have to look at the earth. What is the earth calling us to? What is the land calling us to? But for me, um, what you really helped emphasize is back then we didn't, and I'm gradually getting to be more aware of it, now because of these past couple of years, how we really have to keep on bringing into it um, the original inhabitants and what the indigenous and people of color, what, you know, what are they calling us to? So I, anyway, just thank you very, very much for your, um, your sharing and your work. And I think we'll all um, be able to kind of draw on much of what you said and hopefully um, your book, your insights in your book. So thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Thank you. So maybe uh, one more, if someone has uh, something pressing on their minds or hearts. Kathleen Nolan? Yes, I, I, I would just like to mention that um, there's a group that some of you may be familiar with, the nuns, N-U-N-S, and nuns, N-O-N-E-S. And one of the things that, that they have been working on and drawing religious congregations into this work is, is a land justice project. And for those of you who are in New York, the St. Joseph Sisters of Brentwood are currently working with the Shinnecook Nation along Long Island Sound. And they have created a, a, a farm. I'm trying to, it um, goes back to the early native practices of uh, along the, you know, along the sound where the native people were. And they are redoing that. And one of the, the um, I can't think of the, the kelp, it's a kelp farm. Right. And one of the things that that kelp is doing and this doing raising the kelp is restoring the um the sound and the 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 um clearing the pollution of the sound. So this is a, a way of of um of what you're talking about, Dr. Clark, in terms of communities reclaiming and coming together and reclaiming and and um uh restoring the land yeah so there are these projects that are very much in process already the other thing i that i can't get out of my mind is um i i you know i loved what you said about this uh look the spatial um way of seeing god because it reminds me is it really harkens back to the the 12th 13th century mystics particularly mm -hmm. Um, Meister Eckhart, and and he says the same thing that you say about God and God in all and we in in all in God, and then Thich Nhat Han more recently. I think it's very connected to the 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 Buddha and what yeah. Thich Nhat Han how Thich Nhat Han um, 
teaches about relationship to to Buddha. So, um, you know, it, it really, it, um, I think that's a a new consciousness that you that that you're bringing to us, uh, but a consciousness that was very much a part of our our church in the with among the mystics. Yeah. Yeah, um I, I think you're right. And I, I for that reason I was going to sort of frame this as a, a, a more pluralistic approach to thinking about God because it is true that not just this is not just true of Christianity, but there are other faith traditions mm -hmm. that that have a similar notion of God. Um um uh, so yeah so it's it's uh it offers us a more plural which is what the whole project is trying to do like so it's not just remember what cone says it's not just one religion that offers us a way out in terms of ecological healing healing mm -hmm. the earth it has to be a more pluralistic sort of openness to hearing what other voices have to say mm -hmm. about this so yeah you you're right on with that thank you Thank you for your um, talk tonight and the insights that you shared with us. Thank you. So it's uh, a little past 7.30, so we should uh, think about wrapping up, although uh, uh, we'll be carrying the wealth of what we heard from uh, Dr. Clark, I'm sure, for a long time and, and uh, uh, reflect on it and, more importantly, put it into practice. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Clark, the students at Manhattan College are lucky to have you. Uh, thank you, thank you. And um, uh, thank you for everything you shared with us. And um, uh, again, it, it's uh, uh, a unique and deep uh, and insightful message that we'll, uh, we'll have to learn, uh, contemplate a lot more, and even more importantly, act on. And thanks to all of you. Um, I'll send around the link of the, the um, uh, presentation. I also put in the chat the, the link to uh, Dr. Clark's book. Uh, so um, uh, show your gratitude by getting a copy and it'll be, <laughs> be a wonderful gift to yourself as well. So thanks to all of you. Have a wonderful night uh, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.